This is it. Right here. See this little drip, drip, drip? Okay. And listen for just a second. This is what has created this. This little bit of water is the key ingredient for creating some amazing places that are right beneath our feet. We know about the paths that water makes through our landscapes with rivers and streams, but how about the pathways that water carves underground? We don't often see those hidden places. I'm John, and I'm a big fan of caves. And I'm M. Chad Edwards. I could talk shop about fresh water and trails and trees, but I'm learning about caves. I work for the U.S. Forest Service, which stewards 193 million acres of national forests and grasslands throughout the nation, including thousands of caves and springs. These are all public lands, so if you think about it, I work for you. Now, during this program, we'll be exploring some caves in the Ozark St. Francis National Forest in northern Arkansas, and taking a look at some other caves around the country. We're going to learn about how caves and cars are pathways that connect us, as well as plants, animals, and water to the world below. Caves and karst? I know what a cave is, but what about karst? It's a landscape defined by caves, springs, sinkholes, and disappearing streams, just like that one. You see how these tiny trickle goes into these rocks and just disappears? Like many places in the United States, this area is formed with limestone rock. And here's a map showing where to find caves and cars across the country. If you're interested in caves like me, then there's probably one not too far from where you live that you could visit. The National Caves Association also has many great maps of where to find caves near you. Hey, um, here's some folks going by right now. Well, they're going on a wild cave tour, which means they'll get to crawl around and get a close look at the caverns. Caves are so much fun to explore. Yeah, so they're gonna go underground, like under all these big rocks. Yeah, I'm gonna have to take your word on that about being fun. But how about you tell me about why we should care about caves? Well, knowing about caves and cars is important for many reasons. Groundwater connects springs, wells, and other drinking water sources for people and wildlife, so we need to know about the geology of cave systems. Caves support unique biological communities. They provide information about human history, and many people find that caving is really interesting. Yeah, I'm getting excited about learning more. All right, so let's go check in with a couple of scientists, right? Because they're gonna talk to us a little bit more about why caves are such an important resource. Let's go meet Fernando Hernandez. He's one of our rock star scientists. Because he's a geologist, a rock, rock star. All right, pardon the dad joke. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the geology of this area? Yeah, of course. The story about this area and many areas with limestone rock started millions and millions of years ago. Shallow seas once covered this area, and as shells from craters in these shallow seas drifted to the bottom, they mixed with mud and organic matter that gradually compressed into layers of limestone. Then, over more millions of years, water flowed to the limestone to carve out caves. We got a team of geologists and hydrologists here today studying how the water and air that we see, feel, and use on the surface create these fascinated places down below. As you mentioned, water is the critical ingredient that creates these features and connects with everything. You should go and talk to Johanna Kovarik. She is the cave and karst coordinator of the U.S. Forest Service. I see you guys inside the cave. Hey, Johanna. Hey, what's up? Uh, please tell me what's going on because you're dressed like a canary in a mine shaft. Should I be concerned? No, you should not be concerned. So, what do you have there? This is the dye. We're going to put it in the water. Go ahead, Nima. One way to study where the water goes underground is to put non-harmful dye into the water. This shows us where the water goes and where it flows underground. So, why do we need to know exactly where the water goes? By understanding where the groundwater flows, we can help to protect its cleanliness, not only for ourselves, but also for the environment. We can understand how karst features on the surface are connected with the world beneath our feet. Oh, I can't wait to see where that dye shows up. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Joanna. You're welcome.
So also with us today is Gretchen Baker. And she's a cave ecologist. Now, before you get started, I have to let you know, before this, I didn't know the difference between a cave and a hole in the ground. So tell me kind of what it is that you study, what do you do? I and other biologists and ecologists are really interested in bats, salamanders, and other creatures that live in caves. They bring nutrients into caves, and that's a really important process. Water is a big deal as well. We'll be checking out how water connects the biota from the surface to the subsurface. And we also study what lives in different zones of the cave. So caves have zones? They sure do. Should we take a look? Yeah, let's go exploring. Okay, wait, 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 wait. If you're getting me in that thing, we're gonna talk safety first, all right? So what are some ways we can stay safe inside the cave? Caves are fun to explore, but it's important to stay safe. So never go underground alone. Make sure you have the appropriate training and gear to explore a cave. Always go in a group with experienced cavers. If you are interested in caves in many places in the country, you can go visit right now with an experienced guide. Here's our gear. Let's suit up. There are three zones in a cave. This opening where we are standing it's called the entrance zone. When a person pictures a cave, they usually imagine this area and the animals and plants that are associated with it. Notice the change in temperature. Yeah, it's way cooler down here than it was up there. When air moves in and out of the cave, it causes changes in temperature, and these changes create a special environment. This is where life enters and leaves the cave. And this area around cave entrances and sinkholes is very important. Let's walk a little further into the cave. All right, after you. This area is known as the twilight zone. Many rare plants and animals like to hang out in this zone, which is a little further underground. And if you look further back, you can see the dark zone. The dark zone. Believe it or not, there are different kinds of life that live in the dark zone as well. Let's head on back and see what's there. Burr, it's crazy cold in here. It is. The cave is a constant 58 degrees Fahrenheit and almost 100% humidity year round. The cave temperature reflects the average outside temperature of the area. So if you go to a colder climate or higher elevation, the cave will be colder. And if you go someplace warmer, then that cave would be warmer. Hey, look, there's some light up there. And a cave is coming down. Is this another entrance into the cave? Yes, there can be many entrances into one cave system. This means there are many places where nutrients and energy can enter the system and also many different habitats for different creatures. Hey, what are you doing in the cave? I'm part of a team mapping the cave with Fernando. Do you want to come with me to find the team and learn more about the cave? Actually, that sounds awesome. And I'm going to go join up with my group of researchers. Well, I hope we can find you down here because I can't wait to see what it is you all discover. Wow. Oh, hey, Fernando. Where are we? Well, John, this large area here at the entrance King Scavern, it's called the Grand Canyon. Remember the little trickle of water we saw earlier? Well, it's been joined by more and more trickles of water moving to the rock to create this large and beautiful underground river. Like we said, caves form over millions of years. Here in Arkansas, caves form in limestone rock. Water moves from the surface, as we saw, through cracks and poor spaces in the rock. Surface water starts out slightly acidic and can pick up acids from microbes in the soil as it moves down into the subsurface, creating caves and larger pathways for water to flow. As you said above ground, these areas are known as karst, a word from a beautiful area in Slovenia where this was first described. 
As groundwater dissolves limestone, it picks up calcite, the building block of most cave formations, like these. How water moves determines what shape these formations take. But one thing for sure is that they take millions of years to form. Here at Blanchard, it takes about 150 years for one cubic centimeter of calcite to deposit, which is about the size of an almond. 150 years to grow the size of an almond? That's going to make this taste even better. But you didn't want one, did you? So cave formations like stalactites and stalagmites, right? Hey, actually, I have a good way to remember these formations. Stalactites are the one that hang tight to the ceiling, and the stalagmites might grow up big and tall one day. That's right, Amshed. They give us some clues about how this cave and the world around it might have looked on the past. As you learn, caves have relatively stable microclimates, make them ideal to record the local climate of the caves. As I mentioned, this cave formed from water coming down from up above, but some caves form through water moving up from below, or a combination, some caves form completely differently in other types of rock, like lava tubes in places like Oregon, Washington, or Hawaii. Caves can form along coastlines as sea caves through the mechanical erosion caused by wind and waves. Or they even form in glaciers. These type of areas are called pseudocarps because they don't form through dissolution like caves in limestone, marble, or dolomite. So why and how exactly do you map caves? I work with the Cave Research Foundation and we map caves so we can understand how they form and where the water flows. This team here is working on mapping a cave right now. They use a laser called a disto to measure distances. 9.3 meters. And an inclinometer to measure vertical extent of the cave. So you can hear them calling out measurements and Fernando is the sketcher. He is making an actual 3D sketch of the cave on paper. Let's check out this video. Hi, I'm Malcolm Williamson. I'm a senior research scientist at the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies, better known as CAST, here at the University of Arkansas. We have these systems that are known as LIDAR, that's light distance and ranging, that uses a laser beam to measure distances and angles and records those as measurements that can then become a 3D model. The machine behind me here can actually record up to one million measurements per second. And it rotates around and looks every direction and it's really easy to scan a cave very accurately with this. And so our job was to go in and document everything that's been added by people into that cave. So the walkways and the elevator and the railings and lights and things like that because they hope to be doing some improvements to the cave to make it more friendly to visitors. So we will take literally hundreds of these at Blanchard Springs from different locations because you can't see everywhere from one location and you can't see behind a stalactite over here and uh, around uh, uh, you know, a rock over here. So we have to move the scanner around and then in our software, it'll automatically stitch these together to become a very, very large uh, file and a big model of the cave. So today, this instrument that we've got right here is about the most accurate way that we can map a cave. Back to you, Amchat. And so now let's watch another video so we can see how and why some other types of caves are mapped. I'm Matt Covington from the University of Arkansas, and I also study and map caves. One of the types of caves I've gotten interested in recently is a cave in glaciers. We went to the Arctic up to Svalbard and went inside of caves that form in the ice. And there we were using some new mapping techniques that, that we're developing. Actually creating a full 3D scan of the cave and instead of just making measurements and, and, and surveying a line and sketching the features, we create a full model. And we've been doing that initially with a video game controller, the Xbox Kinect, which is not very expensive compared to most science equipment, but basically it's a really cheap 3D scanner that we don't have to worry about destroying in the cave and all the mud in the water. So there's still a lot of things that we don't understand about how caves form. And creating these 3D models allows us to, to make really precise measurements of the shapes of the caves. And as a cave scientist, we actually use those shapes to read the story of the formation of the cave. There's certain types of cave features that their, you know, their size, for example, relates to how fast the water was flowing when the cave formed. And so we can read those stories off the walls 
and, and start to learn more about some, some of the mysteries of cave formation that scientists haven't yet figured out. Wow, mapping caves is really interesting. Hey, does the water look kind of green to you from there? That means the water from above the ground, where we started this morning, flows right through here. That's right. So where does all of this water go as it continues on its journey? Well, it continues through the underground cavern and resurface at springs and wells. And like we said, that's the water that people use to drink and for agriculture and recreation. And it's important to know where this water flows. Wow, that is pretty interesting. This whole geologic tour you took us on totally rocked. All right, hey John, let's get back and see what Gretchen and the rest of the research team have been doing. Yeah? All right, cool. All right, bye. Hey, bye guys. See you later. Thank you. Hi Gretchen, we're back. Hey John and Amtat. Hey, we're really deep into the dark zone right now. The cave ecosystem is really different from the surface ecosystem, where the sun helps plants grow and form the basis of our food web. In cave ecosystems, the light of the sun doesn't reach very far. However, air, people, animals, and water all bring nutrients into the cave environment. From underground aquifers, which are areas that are completely filled with water beneath the water table, to partially dry passages, they are all full of life. My team and I are surveying this area to see what lives here. Let's watch a video from the Bug Chicks, and they'll tell us a little bit more about what lives in caves. Jess, we have got to get out of town this weekend. I'm getting antsy. Yeah, I feel you on that. Where do you want to go? Beach? We were just there teaching. Mountains? I feel like we should go somewhere we don't normally go, you know? Okay, desert, rainforest. They sound cool, but... Oh! I have an idea. Let's, Let's say it at the same, same time. time. One, two, three. The Caves. Monster Museum. Yours is better. Let's do yours. <laughs> I just think we haven't been to a cave in a long time. They have troglofauna, cool ecosystems. Whoa. Jessica, you had me at troglofauna. Troglofauna is the fancy word for cave dwelling animals. They have special adaptations that allow them to survive in extreme environments. Now, we're gonna have to do a bug chick's vocabulary breakdown because saying cave dwelling animals doesn't really give you the whole picture. Here we go. Troglo means cave and fauna means animals. But not all cave dwellers are the same. There are troglo zines, zine means visitor, and these are animals that can visit a cave ecosystem. They can come and go freely, but they can't spend their entire life cycle in the cave. Some famous examples of troglozines are bats, pack rats, moths, and some species of beetles. Then there are the troglophiles. These are animals that can live outside of caves, but they prefer to be inside them. Yeah, that's right, because they love caves. <laughs> File means one that loves. Examples of troglophiles include certain species of arachnid, crayfish, and salamander. And finally, there are the very cool troglo lights. These are true cave dwellers. These animals spend their entire lives inside of a cave and can't survive outside them. They're usually pale, because who needs color in absolute dark, and blind. In fact, many species have what's called vestigial eyes. These are mere remnants of the eyes their ancestors used to have, and they're shrunken and the animals can't see. Arthropod troglobites include these millipedes, shrimp, and isopods. Lots of cave arthropods have these incredible body parts that have evolved over millions of years to help them thrive, eat, and not get eaten. Speaking of millions of years, time, time travel, travel segment. segment. A few years ago, Christy and I wanted to see some local tribal fauna. So we traveled to the Oregon caves in the Rogue Siskiyou National Forest in search of giant cave crickets. Oh, what's in here? What's in here? <laughs> what is this? Look at those long tarsal segments. Everything about them is adapted to live in this environment. These cave crickets are a great example of morphological adaptation. Check out those long antennae, the extended palps and cerci, and those incredible back legs. These adaptations help the cricket sense potential predators that might be nearby and help them feel around in the dark. Our day in the caves did not disappoint. We went deep underground and got to see animals you don't normally get to see. Scientists don't really know much about this species of cave cricket, so being in a cave is like visiting an alien planet, but it's in our backyard. Oh, 
Oh, I miss those caves. I want to go back. I thought you might. So while that segment was playing, I whipped up some special costumes so that we can dress up like troglofauna, complete with morphological details that are going to help us survive. <sighs> Cosplay! Can we go to a nearby cave? Can we try them out? Yes. Now, using the measurements of the cave crickets in the last segment, I extrapolated using our body length and figured out that our antennae should be about eight feet long. Oh. All right. Now, ooh, vestigial eyes? Yeah, yeah, these are mine. Okay, and then I'll take these that are super big to capture as much light in the dark cave as possible. Oh, <laughs> oh I almost forgot. Okay, our legs. <laughs> Not a judge. Ooh. Ooh. I forgot how chilly it could be in a cave. Oh, I brought tea. You did? Yeah. Awesome. I brought a joke. Okay. What's a bug's favorite sport? Mm, I don't know what. Cricket. <laughs> Wait. So I would be a troglozine? <laughs> yeah, that's right. We could be considered troglozines. So Gretchen, what else lives in caves? Perhaps the organisms that are most home in caves are microbes, which are microscopic organisms that are part of our everyday lives. The microbes that live in caves could help us develop new medicines, such as antibiotics. Scientists are also really interested in microbes that live in caves called extremophiles because they have adapted to extreme environments similar to what we might find on other planets. Dr. Boston from NASA is going to tell us more about microbes. My name is Penny Boston and I'm an astrobiologist and a cave scientist who focuses on geomicrobiology. I work in the United States in the state of New Mexico and I visit caves all over the world and look at the microorganisms that live there. I study what they do to the rocks and minerals and unique biosignatures that they may be producing because of those interactions with the minerals. So that's the setting that uh, brings me to uh, caves. And part of the reason that we are tremendously interested in the kinds of life forms that we find in the subsurface is for a number of different reasons. One is because they're very poorly studied here on Earth. There's very little work that has been done on these organisms. So it's an entire area of Earth biology that has only uh, been studied a very little bit. So that's one major aspect of it. The second aspect of it is uh, looking for environments that have different aspects of them that might be important uh, models for life on other planets. So for example, on Earth we have hot caves, we have cold caves, we have acid caves, we have caves with poisonous gases in them. All of these different kinds of examples uh, can inform us about how microbial life rises to the occasion and uh, learns to adapt and live in these kind of environments. One of the other important aspects of caves and space exploration is that we now know that there are many caves on other bodies in the solar system, particularly Mars and Earth's moon. Uh, we have uh, detected and mapped many of these features. And so the potential exists for future human use, for human exploration in these kinds of structures. The ability of the rock that is the uh, overlying material over a cave is very good at helping to screen out very high uh, energy ionizing radiation. And this is a major hazard in space flight and space uh, habitation on other planets. And so these natural features, because they already exist in these environments, provide us with an ability to actually modify those for human use with much less payload penalty than if we had to take all of that structure and all of that radiation protection with us. A very important aspect of being in the subsurface and, um, and using caves as an analog for extreme environments like other planetary surfaces is because it really is psychologically a transforming experience. 
when you go into the subsurface for a short trip into a show cave, for example, you don't really feel the full extent of it. But when you explore caves and you are in for many days, your whole sensory abilities are different. You don't hear the same things that you hear on the surface. You don't smell the same smells. You don't um, feel the wind on your skin in the same way. And so you don't see the same way because you are restricted to the light that you have with you. And so this really is like entering an alien world. It's like going on an expedition to another planet. And so for training people to experience that as a preparation for operations in extreme environments and outer space environments, it's an invaluable analog. And we have used that uh, in many different contexts. And so I recommend it as an experience that all people who are aspiring to uh, go into space or do other very difficult tasks would benefit from. I want to visit caves on other planets. That would be amazing. But for now, there's a lot for us still to learn and discover in caves right here on Earth. So are you ever finding like animal bones and things down here? Absolutely. Barb Beasley, a paleontologist with the U.S. Forest Service, is going to tell us more about studying fossils. You all can watch this while I head back to work with my team, and I hear there's a wild caving group coming through if you'd like to join up with them. Thanks a bunch, Gretchen. I feel like I know so much more about cave ecology now. What a great job you have. I'm here today to show you about one of the very important things that, about animals that used to live in caves. They've become preserved. And unlike all the situations with typically when fossils are fossilized outside of a cave, here caves have such a constant temperature and humidity that um, they're preserved over a long period of time. Some of the other animals that have been preserved for over hundreds of thousands of years have been mammoths and mastodons. Those are elephants. And what I have here is a mastodon tooth. And of course, elephants didn't live in caves because they couldn't, they're too tall. So they're drug into the caves by predators after they were killed. And then I have a mammoth tooth, which is another elephant. And then something that's unusual would be a giant ground sloth. This is just its claw. And these ground sloths lived within these caves over uh, thousands of years. And why are fossils important? Well, they kind of tell us about what the climatic changes are going on. The small mammals and small animals in particular are very persnickety about the kind of environment. They, they like their home to be very comfortable. And if things change, if the climate changes, the temperature changes, or the food disappears, they will actually move. And so their presence or absence within these cave layers, within the sediments that are deposited in these caves, uh, change. That helps scientists know when the fossils are there and when the animals were there or when they left. Wow, it's exciting to think of all the interesting discoveries and things that we can learn about life long time ago, right here in caves. Hey, there's the group of cavers. Dude, let's do it. I'm M. Chide Edwards with the U.S. Forest Service. Hey. It's my good friend John, John the Phenomenon. <gasps> um, we've learned a ton today with a cave ecologist and a geologist, and now we kind of want to hang out with you guys. Is that cool? Sure, I'm taking this group of people on the adventure of their life. It looks like you guys have all the proper safety equipment, so follow me. I've been a guide here for around five years, and people love coming underground to crawl, climb, and see a world that is so different from the surface. Our cave here at Blanchard Springs, as well as many caves around the world, offer a fun way to get out and explore. There are even clubs called grottos where you can learn more about how to explore caves safely and with conservation in mind. All right, guys, let's go explore some more passage this way. Actually, I think I see Fernando and Gretchen over there. We really got to catch back up with our group. All right, thanks for coming. Yo, this has been a ton of fun. Thank you, Zoe. See ya. Okay, see bye now. Bye. Hey, guys. Hey. 
Okay. That was fun. <laughs> it was so cool. I wanted to go up every passage. Well, that's what we enjoy mapping. We document every little passage to see where it goes. You never know where it might take you. And who knows? We might be in the longest cave in the world. We learned that caves exist in many places around the world, and people have always been interested in them. The record of human activity in caves goes back centuries. People have always used caves as pathways, protection from the elements, and places to live. So let's watch this video and see how other people view them. This is the Unica River, located in Slovenia, a tiny country in the center of Europe. We will visit the mysterious origins of this river in a place hidden away where most people have never seen. Today is a special day for these children. They are visiting a place deep under the surface of the earth, Planinska Yama. Yama means cave in Slovenian. of the cave, we see the Unica River rushing to the surface over a dam, which was once used to power a sawmill, but now is used by a hydroelectric power plant. Before going inside, the visitors must first unlock the gate, which ensures that only people that have permission to visit the cave can go inside. This cave is part of an extensive cave system where the science of cave biology was born. And it is here that the children's search for cave animals begins. The first stop is at a giant funnel used in the past to study cave formation. Next, the children notice bats. Bats leave their droppings or guano behind, which is an important food source for cave critters, such as these millipedes. Cave animals are tiny and need to be searched for carefully. The children are observing the remains of a slender neck beetle, the first cave animal in the world to be scientifically described. Cave animals have special characteristics. They lack body pigmentation and eyes, but instead have elongated legs and antenna to sense their environment. The Pistoina Planina cave system holds the world record for the highest number of different cave species found in it. In the waters, the children found cave crustaceans, but the most famous animal in the cave river is the Proteus, an amphibian which can only be found in this part of the world. The cave also shows signs of human presence. In the first part of the 20th century, the military built many pathways through the cave, including this tunnel through solid rock. Before we end our visit of Planinska Yama, we can see where the Unica River begins at the unique underground confluence of the Rock and Puka Rivers. We will leave you with one last extraordinary cave experience, true darkness. That was a great tour through the cave. What'd you think? You know what? Actually, it wasn't so scary at all. Once I got underground, it was pretty cool. Plus, I learned a ton, so that's a win-win situation. It's important to understand how caves are formed and how water goes through the cave passages. And who knew about all the light that's actually found in there? Remember that little trickle of water? That water has followed us on our journey today and has joined us here at the surface of this spring. The water just shoots through the rocks from the underground at a rate of 10 millions of gallons of water a day. Pretty awesome. See the dye on the water? I collected this sample on the way out. That means that the water that is on the surface and trickle down to the underground, it's connected to this huge amount of flowing water. Sure enough, the water is green. If there were any contamination upstream where we started this morning, it would have ended up right here. And it's also important to know that people are drinking out of this water and swimming downstream. And since I'm the ecologist and biologist, I'll just add that this water is also home to unique creatures. Protecting this groundwater protects them as well. Springs are groundwater dependent ecosystems with unique types of life forms all their own. While caves aren't everywhere, groundwater is. Around the world, we depend on it for drinking, agriculture, and recreation like 
fishing and swimming. So let's, uh, let's kind of throw out some things that we can all do to help protect our groundwater and pay. Conserving water use is also important for many reasons, especially in areas that are really dry. Turn off the water when you brush your teeth, or consider taking a shorter shower and making sure that those leaky faucets get fixed. Invasive species are a problem in general, but also in caves. For example, bat populations have been devastated by white nose syndrome, an invasive fungus in caves. Let's hear more about how bats in the United States are threatened. Hello, my name is Jonathan Reichard and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where I help bats affected by white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is a disease caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which we call PD for short. PD grows in cold, dark, damp places like caves and mines where bats go in the winter to hibernate. During hibernation, they allow their body temperatures to drop to near freezing, and by doing so, they survive the winter months only on energy they have stored in their bodies because there are no insects around to eat. While bats are relatively inactive during hibernation, PD attacks and grows on them. The fungus can look like a white powder on the bat's face, which is how white nose syndrome got its name. It also grows on wings and other places where it can eat holes right through a bat's skin. In addition to damaging skin, these infections cause bats to warm up and become active, wasting precious energy they need to make it through the winter. Sometimes they fly out of their shelters, looking for food and water, but there are no insects, so the bats freeze or starve to death. Millions and millions of bats have been killed from white nose syndrome, which as Gretchen said, is caused by an invasive species that came from somewhere else and is causing harm. In the case of PD, we really don't know how it got here, but the fungus can travel on bats as they move around, and it is possible for people who come in contact with bats or their habitats to accidentally spread the fungus if it gets on their shoes or clothing and they travel to other places where bats hibernate. No matter how it got here, PD spores took hold in that New York cave and the fungus quickly spread between bats, so now it's found in at least 33 states and five provinces in Canada, affecting at least nine species of bats in North America. Thankfully, other mammals, including you, do not get white nose syndrome. However, because PD spores can hitch a ride on your shoes, clothes, or even your backpack, to protect bats, it's important to clean and disinfect your clothes and anything else with you after you go to a place that might have PD in it. For more about how to reduce the risk of spreading white nose syndrome, visit whitenosesyndrome.org, which has more information about the disease and what you can do to help. Here at Blanchard Springs, Visitors walk through disinfectants to make sure that they don't carry the white nose fungus on their shoes into the cave. You see, one big thing is to not dump trash in caves, waterways, or sinkholes. People sometimes use caves as places to put trash, thinking out of sight, out of mind. But now we all know it doesn't work that way. I think learning about caves and cave geology is really important, just like we did today. If you don't know how things are connected, then you may not conserve these important areas. Hey. Thank you all for all of those suggestions. And I gotta say, I really did enjoy my time underground today. Thank you to you and all of our experts. I hope you'll take some time to learn more about caves and their resources at caveslive.org. Remember, caves are unique and amazing places and are connected with our everyday lives. The more you know, the more you will value these extraordinary places and realize how we are all connected both above and below the surface. Bye.